Thank you. Thank you all for being here. On behalf of the trustees and the staff and the volunteers of the Computer History Museum, I want to welcome you to the 26th of our fellow awards events. We are always delighted at these events to welcome previously inducted fellows. And I think tonight we have among us Federico Fagin, Ed Feigenbaum, Don Knuth, and Chuck Thacker. Thank you all for coming. We have many other distinguished guests here tonight as well, but I particularly want to acknowledge a couple of international visitors. We have here Dr. David Hartley and Kevin Murrell, who have been here this week visiting from the UK, from the National Museum of Computing there at Bletchley Park. And we're delighted to see that other folks are finally getting serious about recording computer history as well. <laughs> we look forward to collaborating. We've been working with them on ways to collaborate. You know, we do recognize that the Brits had something to do with the early computers, you know, like inventing it. So we're delighted to see that activity there. I'd like again this year to thank Trustee Ike Nassi for running the Fellows Selection Committee and to acknowledge the help of Cynthia Holliday of Upright Mar uh, Marketing for managing the process. Thank you, Ike. Thank you, Cynthia. And we also, of course, have a slightly uh, anonymous committee of judges. It changes from year to year, but that committee takes the difficult task of finding the next year's fellows. Now, we do accept public nominations. So if you'd like to submit a nomination for next year's award, uh, watch our website for an announcement in a little while, and there'll be a form for you to fill out there. So please uh, keep that in mind. I want to read uh, excerpts of an article that appeared last month in the online magazine uh, Boing Boing. It was written by a young man named Alex Marx, and, and this is what he says. The year was 1973, and I was a 21-year-old right out of UCLA film school. Though most of my days were spent looking for a job, I did manage to squeeze in a lunch with my 83-year-old grandfather at least once a week. Now, maybe you can guess who this is. Remember, his name is Alex Marx. His 83-year-old grandfather was Groucho Marx. <laughs> so he goes on. He says, this particular day, my grandfather asked me to be ready to accompany him on the piano, since he planned to sing for the invited guests, who were Jack Nicholson, Elliot Gould, and the great French mime Marcel Marceau. You never knew who would arrive for lunch with Groucho. As Nicholson began telling everyone about his latest movie, The Last Detail, which would be released in a few months, the phone rang. My grandfather, never one to have his lunch or a good story interrupted, asked me to answer it. I walked into the kitchen, picked up the phone. Is Mr. Marks in? The voice at the other end said. Who's calling? I said. I work at the NBC storage warehouse in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, the man said. We've got several boxes of 16 millimeter reels of film from You Bet Your Life. And we were wondering if Mr. Marx wants any of it, and if not, we're going to destroy it all tomorrow. My grandfather said, tell him to burn them for all I care, eliciting laughs from his guests. Well, I'm happy to report that the grandson disobeyed his famous grandfather. And two weeks later, five UPS trucks showed up delivering 5,000 reels of film to Grouch's house, filling all of the available space in a chaotic scene that Alex says resembled the Marx Brothers movie. <laughs> what these were were the only complete set, the only recordings of Groucho's You Bet Your Life radio and TV show from the 1940s and the 1950s. So fast forward now 40 years from the date of that phone call. All those shows have now been preserved and digitized. And you can watch them. A lot of them are on YouTube. You can watch them streaming and elsewhere. They weren't, thankfully, lost forever. Now, if you were to listen to one of those rescued episodes, the one, in fact, from May 10th, 1950, back when it was only on radio, before it was on TV, this is what you would have heard. Dr. Harry Husky, huh? You have an electronic brain? What's inside this idiot? Well, there's about 2,000 radio tubes, about uh, 40 television tubes, and miles of wire. 2,000 radio tubes? No, no. wonder it's feeble-minded, huh? 
the, the control part of the machine, or brains of the machine, if yeah. you like, looks at the uh, instructions. What? By How do you know it's looking at it? Maybe it's looking at something else. It's <laughs> pretty tricky, those machines. I don't know. What a combination, Harry Husky and Groucho Marx. You. <laughs> what a pleasure to have it preserved. You'll hear more clips from that show later, and of course, much more about Harry Husky. The computer they were talking about was the SWAC, which was the first computer built in California, and for a year was the fastest computer in the world. Incidentally, the other guest on Groucho's show that day was a scrap metal dealer who on the spot offered Harry $100 for the computer based on the fact that it weighed three tons. <laughs> now, listening to Groucho is great fun, but there's also an important lesson here about the fragility of our links with the past. It's so easy for 5,000 reels of historic film to wind up in a corporate dumpster forever, or parts of the world win computer, or the source code to Apple's Mac Paint, or the DataQuest archives, or more than a thousand laboratory notebooks from Fairchild Semiconductor, which have been called the Dead Sea Scrolls of Silicon Valley. At the Computer History Museum, we don't usually preserve TV shows, but we do preserve computers, source code, laboratory notebooks, photographs, films, manuals, personal artifacts, and much more. In fact, everything needed to document and explain how this invention came to be and how it's changing civilization. In a funny way, we preserve the people, too. By our in-depth videotaped oral histories, we have over 700 of them now, and we're continuing to do more. And by events like the one tonight, where we put our pioneers up on pedestals and recognize them as heroes of this revolution. This is important work, which we have only been able to do because of your help. And help you do in many ways, as collectors, as storytellers, as ambassadors, as constructive critics, and of course, as financial supporters. Thank you for all of that, and thank you for coming tonight. Now I'd like to turn over the podium to John Holler, who, as the dynamic and tireless CEO and executive director of the Computer History Museum for five years, has been responsible for taking us from one success to another. Please welcome John Holler. Lynn, thank you so very much. That was wonderful. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I want to add my welcome to Lynn's welcome tonight. Uh, let me first say that <clears throat> if those signs in the middle of the table are blocking your view of any screens, feel free to just get up right now and take the sign off of the uh, centerpiece because I saw a few of you craning your necks around and we want you to be entirely comfortable tonight. And in fact, uh, the filmmaking is so good that I think you're going to see tonight. I want you to be able to see every minute. This is traditionally one of the most sparkling evenings that we have uh, all year long. And I'm looking at you and I'm saying, you are sparkling. So thanks very much for coming tonight and uh, we're delighted that you're all here. This is one of the largest crowds that we have ever had for a fellows event. The only evening since I've been here that has been larger was the night that uh, one of the fellows was Linus Torvalds. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Linus wrote a famous operating system called Linux, and if you don't know what Linux is, just let me say that if you reached in your pocket and you, and you took this out and Linux stopped working, this would stop working, and it wouldn't work again until Linux came back up. So that's the kind of impact that our fellows uh, have on the world, as Lynn was saying. All 65 have changed the world forever, and they've changed it for better, and preserving and telling those stories in the history, as Lynn was alluding to, uh, not only is important to us, but we think it's a real privilege, and it makes it fun to come to work every day. Fellows represents the hard work and support of plenty of people, and I would like to say thank you to them as well for just a moment. Uh, I will welcome Darla Anderson more formally in a while, but Darla, uh, who is our MC tonight from Pixar, thank you very much. It's great to have you here. Our uh, 
Our sort of anchor tenants tonight, the sponsors, the major sponsors of this uh, evening are uh, IEEE and the IEEE Foundation and the Silicon Valley Executive Network. We're very happy to have both of you involved tonight, so thank you very much. We have a large number of patron sponsors. They're here uh, for you to see. They're also mentioned in your program. I'm not going to uh, personally, at this moment, thank every single one of them, but I do want to make a special thank you to the one in the top left-hand corner, 1185 Designs, and Peggy Burke. Her team is incredible, working on the graphics every year. They do it pro bono. Thank you, Peggy, for everything that you do. We have a great team of trustees, some of whom were on the previous slide, and you'll see them as they scroll through here. Uh, they have been very instrumental in bringing us this evening, and last but certainly not least, the Mountain Winery. Our vice chairman, Dave House, is the managing director of Mountain Winery. All that incredible wine you're enjoying, enjoying tonight comes from the Mountain Winery. Dave, thank you very, very much. I think we have one of the best nonprofit boards in the country, and that begins with our chairman, Lynn Shustick. Uh, only Lynn could get up here and within 95 seconds mention not only Federico Fagin and Ed Feigenbaum, but Groucho Marx as well. <laughs> I know he searched the internet for that particular audio clip and that story, and it really is brilliant. Uh, and it also, I think, illustrates why computer history is so much fun. Every time you turn the corner, you see the linkage between something that's happened that is important from a, from a historical and social perspective and something, something important that has happened from an engineering and technical perspective. And bridging those two worlds is very much what we do all year long. I want to thank, finally, Valerie Alston and Karina Sweet, who produce these evenings and do it so beautifully every year. You can look around you and see the, the fruits of their work. And John Plute is our media director who produces the films that you'll see. I want to recognize also and thank, uh, as Lynn did, Dr. David Hartley from Bletchley Park. Uh, I think David comes by occasionally just to make sure we're not writing the Brits out of history. <laughs> David, I hope you feel good, but I did see you taking careful notes as you walked through Revolution yesterday, so uh, I'm sure you'll let us know anything we're doing wrong. But seriously, David is uh, making an enormous impact in the history of computing in Britain, and we salute him. Second, I want to welcome Marina von Neumann Whitman and her husband, Bob. Now, Marina is an accomplished economist and professor. She was the first woman named to the Council of Economic Advisors by President Nixon. She is the author of a brilliant new book called The Martian's Daughter. And the Martian, you see, was John von Neumann, one of the most important figures in 20th century computing. And she will be here on Monday for a program about her book and her remembrances of her legendary father. And we're so happy to have her here tonight and to help us make that connection with history. You may be wondering why they call them Martians, by the way. Uh, the title of the book comes from the fact that no one at Princeton understood what John von Neumann and his friends were talking about, so they, they called them the Martians because they were speaking a language that no one could, uh, could penetrate. And finally, thank you to our fellows class of 2013, to Ed, to Harry, and to Bob. Congratulations. Uh, we'll hear much more about you later this evening, but we're so delighted to recognize you. I was struck in preparing for this evening that we're honoring two very different pairs of hands. One pair of hands belongs to Harry Husky, who programmed the ENIAC in 1946. The other pair of hands belongs to Ed Catmull, who held the Oscar for the best animated film of 2013 this year for Brave. So think about that, from the ENIAC to Brave. That is about as large a spectrum as you could cover in computing history, and it's one of the things that makes working in this field so much fun and such a privilege. John von Neumann, in fact, is said to have remarked that there's no sense in being precise when you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but our fellows have managed to do something rare and wonderful. They have taken the kernel of a very imprecise idea and they've spun it into something that is of enormous achievement. So we'll hear more about you, gentlemen, and your accomplishments as the evening progresses. It's now my job simply to say, welcome, enjoy your dinner, and we'll be back with you shortly. Thank you. That was uh, the orientation movie from our brilliant exhibit, Revolution, the first 2,000 years of computing downstairs. 
Uh, Harry Sello, who you see there at the end, talk about evenings when people are contemporaries of amazing people. Harry worked for William Shockley at Shockley Semiconductor, and he has an autographed copy of, uh, of Shockley's book on semiconductor science. Harry is 95, and he is a docent here. He yeah, works three days a week. Uh, shaking Harry's hand is like shaking the hand of the hand that shook the hand of George Washington in some ways in Silicon Valley. <laughs> We've been talking all night about our good friend David Hartley, who was, of course, a contemporary of Sir Morris Wilkes, who is a fellow here and was a protege of Morris Wilkes for many years. And uh, Harry Husky will talk tonight about working directly with Alan Turing. And then, of course, we have our, our Next Gen board, who is here uh, tonight, the, a group of uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, venture capital investors, uh, people who have come to Silicon Valley or are here uh, pursuing the same dream and the same excitement that has built Silicon Valley for forever. So it's truly an intergenerational night, and uh, we're so happy that it is. It is every year. The complete list of fellows is in your program, and you'll find the extended profiles of the three pioneers there tonight. And so uh, tonight we're going to focus more on who they are as people and uh, on what they've done. Lynn mentioned that we have a vast oral history program. We interview all of the fellows every year as part of the fellow celebration. We add about 75 oral histories a year or so, and in a moment you'll see some of the highlights of those interviews so you get to know the fellows a little better face to face. Now, if you came tonight hoping to hear stories of major achievement, you will not be disappointed. Uh, I can guarantee you that. But the other thing you hear may surprise you. It always surprises me, and it's part of what I find so amazing about the people we celebrate tonight. It's their air of authenticity and their genuine humility. Viewed through their eyes, uh, great accomplishments are often a case of timing, circumstance, and luck. They always credit other people, not themselves. They talk about their teams. They say, they say things about uh, how fortunate they were to have run across such talented people. Uh, we do put them up on a pedestal for this evening, but I can tell you that they absolutely do not know what it's like to be on a pedestal because they've been too busy down in the trenches with their sleeves rolled up doing real work and making amazing things happen. And with a hall of more than 60 fellows now, it's a wonderful thing to rediscover year after year that such achievement is accompanied by such modesty and generosity. And I'm actually glad for all of you uh, incoming and current fellows that you are somewhat modest about this because if you look at the Hall of Fellows wall outside, and I hope you do tonight, you'll notice we're out of room. We don't, <laughs> we actually don't have room for the three fellows that we're inducting tonight. <laughs> so everybody's picture is going to, everybody's picture is going to get a little bit smaller next year, so. That's where that modesty and generosity is going to come in handy when you see the wall the next time. It's on this evening that I'm always reminded of the famous quote by Albert Einstein in the brilliant biography that Walter Isaacson did of him several years ago when he said, I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious. Passionate curiosity is the fuel of creativity, and someone who knows that very, very well is my friend Darla Anderson, who is our MC for the evening. I thought it was fitting to ask Darla to serve as our host, not only because of Ed and because so many of our friends from Pixar are here tonight, but because she is a, an enormous talent in her own right, and whose work has been more affected in the information age than the work of an animated filmmaker? Darla, as you no doubt read in the program, is an award-winning producer. She has produced A Bug's Life, Monsters, Inc., Cars, and Toy Story 3. The Producers Guild of America named her producer of the year for both Cars and Toy Story 3, and Toy Story 3 was also nominated for the Academy Award. Now, you may be a fan of Finding Nemo, and if you are, you may remember Darla in Finding Nemo, who is her namesake. Darla, in case you don't remember her, was the bright, red-haired, pigtailed, braces-wearing, fish-killing, preteen terror. <laughs> you may remember when the fish went down the drain, and Darla was very happy about that in Finding Nemo. And when you meet her tonight in a minute, you'll see there's absolutely no resemblance, <laughs> thankfully. 
She's based here in Northern California. She works with her friends at Pixar. She appreciates all the fellows tonight. Please join me in welcoming Darla Anderson. Well, so first of all, Darla in Finding Nemo was not uh, the bad one. She was just passionately, passionately curious. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> uh, so I just uh, wrote a quick uh, speech. It should take about an hour or so. If you guys are fine with that. Uh, so, but thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. I'm thrilled to be your host for this evening, and I'm honored to join in celebrating three landmark figures in the history of computing, including my good friend and co-founder at Pixar, Ed Catmull. I really liked John's line about tonight's ceremony, uh, linking the hands that pro uh, programmed the ENIAC and the hands that held this year's Oscar for Best Anim Animated Film. I have to admit, though, that before I discovered the Computer History Museum, I had no idea how to pronounce the word ENIAC, much less what it stands for. So I've learned something valuable in getting ready for tonight, and I'm happy about that. So I've had this tempestuous love affair with computer, anima computer animation and thus computers since I very first saw Pixar's short films, gorgeously rendered in 3D. The look pulled me in and it intrigued me and it captured my imagination. Again, passionately curious. <laughs> and the stories and characters cemented the romance. When I first started at Pixar 20 short years ago, there were lots and lots of computer glitches. There were uh, characters that came back from the render farm with arms sticking out of their heads and shaders gone amok and lots and lots of naked characters, all kinds of interesting shader issues. Um, and I sure wish we could blame the computer for that, but in those pioneering days, it was just us, all of us, trying and exploring and experimenting to come up with new looks or even just the same look day to day. In our adventures at Pixar, Toy Story 2 was a film that defined our company, but it was also a film that almost never came to be for so many reasons, one of the most dramatic being when we lost the entire film when it got completely erased due to a technical director's mistake. Uh, big deal. <laughs> it also so happened that it hadn't been backed up for a month. Another big deal. <laughs> The only reason that this film was saved was because the supervising technical director at the time, our very own Galen Sussman, had copied the film at home because she had just had a baby and she wanted to be spending more time in working from home. That is the only place that that film existed at that time. So. <laughs> so I love, I love that a baby saved Toy Story 2. So it's perfect karma. So Pixar, of course, began as a computer, not a company. You'll learn more about that this evening. And professionally, I've had a lot to do with technology since I've joined Pixar, because naturally, computers are how we get everything done. It's a special experience to be a film producer in that setting, and several things make that special. First, although we're filmmakers working in an ultra-modern world, we still have to think about filmmaking the old-fashioned way. I love, love, love that everything begins with a pencil and a piece of paper, everything, or a whiteboard and a dry erase board. We have um, lighting specialists, we have wardrobe teams, we have set designers just like the old-fashioned way. We have cinematographers and sound designers. We have our own form of makeup artists. And um, you think about that wild mane of shockingly red hair on Merida in Brave. Well, she had, girlfriend had her own team of hairstylists. We, I mean, it took years to style that hair. And that's not, I'm not kidding. We have physical people working out physical problems so they manifest themselves beautifully on the computer. When we start working on stories, we also do many other things the old-fashioned way. We draw on whiteboards, we create storyboards, we review written drafts over and over and over again, trust me, and we mark things up on paper. A final production like Brave takes five years from start to finish. The big difference, of course, is that at some point someone has to sit down in front of a blank screen or screens and make all of that come to life through pixels, not on celluloid anymore. That's where the magic begins. I marvel at how the technical side of the house can do what it does so well. It's really quite stunning to see the music, movie take shape. 
In preparing for tonight, I began to reflect on my life as a film producer has been, how my life as a film producer has been influenced by the people we're honoring at these awards. As I mentioned, I'm definitely not technical, and I didn't set out to learn the technical end of the business when I joined Pixar. But without question, the creative and technical intersect in front of me every single day. And I have three thoughts to share with you tonight about that. First of all, all of us, and I mean not just we at Pixar, but all of us in this room and all of us in this world, really do stand on the shoulders of giants. When I think about Harry Husky programming vacuum tube computers with punched cards, it sounds pretty, pretty primitive these days. And yet think about it, that was less than 70 years ago. The fact that Harry is here with us tonight, by the way, is nothing short of amazing. <laughs> The network that Bob Taylor envisioned and then helped bring to life is barely 40 years old. In a span of time shorter than a human life, Bob and Harry and people like them have changed the world. While I'm in love with my smartphone and it's important to me personally, I'm personally grateful that Andy, Buzz Lightyear, Nemo and Merida, and yes, Darla too, live today because of them. Secondly, I've learned that there's hardly an ounce of difference between a world-class engineer and a world-class artist. We have them working side by side every day at Pixar. I personally have had the good fortune to manage large, large teams of them when we're working on films like Toy Story 3 and Monsters. But I've noticed that talent is talent, whatever the calling. Engineers and artists may approach the problem differently. Uh, they may use different words to sort it out. And they definitely have different social skills. <laughs> it's true. Uh, but a great engineer and a great artist are, at the most fundamental level, tremendously creative people. Some of us look at the great computers here at the museum and we see something gorgeous, something beautiful, not merely useful. So in my mind, these paths have converged in computing for a, computing for a very long time. No one has embodied this or modeled this convergence, convergence of my friend, Ed Catmull. His quiet but profound and bold leadership have set an example for how to bring the artists from both the technical and the artistic side together. Watching Ed all these years encourage the insatiable curiosity, the constant striving for improvement, and challenging the status quo has been inspirational beyond belief. Here's one of the computer giants of the world taking a sculpture, sculpture class alongside fellow employees, embodying the idea that he himself is both a world-class engineer and a world-class artist, and encouraging others to reach across the other side just to play. Third, I've learned that computing is one of those rare fields where we know the best is still yet to come, and we can take that to the bank. Here's an example of power. We have an enormous animation center at Pixar running some of the most amazing software on Earth. In, in terms of compute power, the current Monsters University render farm is greater than the Toy Story render farm by a factor of 5,000. And the odd computer crash here and there can set us back for weeks as we move to the, the finished product. That's how much we depend on our computers. While the final film is, film is beautiful, and if we do our right, if we do our jobs right, entertaining, the process can still seem slow and painful, but all of us know it starts with human hands and human ingenuity that will make next year better than this, and so on, and so on. And we know that's true in every field. Hollywood is all about heroes. The hero's story is our favorite story, and happy Indians are the happiest Indians for movie-going audiences. I think it's totally appropriate tonight quite apart from my admiration from Ed, that someone from the film industry stand before and honor these three heroes. Sure, Harry Husky may not be a household name like Buzz Lightyear, but he should be. <laughs> he should be. <laughs> Bob Taylor may not be as celebrated as Flick the Ant or Hopper the Grasshopper in A Bug's Life, but he should be. And Ed Catmull may not get the hero's welcome of a Nemo returning home, but he deserves it. <laughs> These are modern day heroes. These are the modern day heroes, the people who have put a dent in the world, the ones who built the future by envisioning it and then working relentlessly toward it. It's a story worthy of Hollywood for sure, and I'm honored to be presenting their awards tonight. 
So our first honoree for the evening is Harry Husky. Dr. Husky worked on the leading edge of computer development in the 1940s, the earliest days of electronic computing. He has worked with Alan Turing and participated in the realization of several landmark computing systems, including the legendary World War II ENIAC. Husky was a designer, but also an educator who devoted his life to computer science education. Tonight, we honor Harry Husky and present a short summary of his contributions to computing. Let's take a look. Harry Husky was a computer engineer before the title existed. In fact, before calculation machines were even called computers. He broke new ground in computing with projects including the ENIAC, the Pilot Ace, the SWAC, and the Bendix G15. He worked with Turing, Eckert and Mockley, and on one memorable occasion, Groucho Marx. Dr. Harry Husky, huh? You have an electronic brain? That's right. What should um, I call you, Dr. Harry or Husky? Uh, anything that you like. Uh, I'm well, from... now, don't, don't go that far. <laughs> Harry Husky was born in the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina. His family later moved to Pocatello, Idaho for its schools, and Harry earned degrees in mathematics and physics. From there, he went to Ohio State. I really learned what mathematics was about then. Before that, it was calculus and plane geometry and whatever. And I, you know, got involved in sets theory and, and uh, more advanced mathematics. So I and learned how to prove theorems and whatever. Husky earned his PhD in 1943 and graduated to a world consumed with war. With his math skills, he was uniquely equipped to serve. I was interested in the war. In fact, I tried to enlist, but uh, I couldn't pass because of glasses. There was uh, projects in the electrical engineering department, the Moore School at the university and I applied for a job there. And since they were classified, they couldn't tell me what they were about, so I had no idea what I would be doing. But when finally clearance came, I, I was showed the ENIAC and worked in computers ever since. ENIAC, the first large-scale electronic computer. Husky worked on punch card input-output panels and wrote manuals for the legendary machine. He worked on a team of 15 men, a team that included Presper Eckert and John Mockley. In 1946, Husky moved to NPL, pursuing Alan Turing's vision of a stored program universal computer. NPL's pilot automatic computing engine became popular with mathematicians and inspired a version called the Deuce, probably the first commercially produced computer in Britain. Husky left NPL in 1948 to design and lead fabrication of the standards Western automatic computer, SWAC. It was an era when the general public viewed computers as science fiction, mysterious electronic brains. Husky attempted to enlighten folks with the help of Groucho Marx. Uh, doctor, uh, what, what is this, uh, this machine for, this robot? Um, well, it's to carry out uh, sequences of computations from to compare figures. If you're going to compare figures, I don't need an electric brain for that. <laughs> it's a large-scale electronic computing machine. Well, what does it compute? Well, it's, uh, it's just being put together. We still have some parts to put into it. Uh, it doesn't compute anything yet. <laughs> Can't even add two and two? <laughs> what a schlemiel that is, eh? Despite this humorous introduction, the SWAC was completed in July 1950 and was briefly the fastest computer in the world. It was one of the first computers in the U.S. and was kept in continuous service for 17 years. At UC Berkeley 1956, Husky designed the G15, producing the block diagram for the complete machine. Unlike other computers of the day which filled a room, the G15 was tiny, about the size of a refrigerator. 
In order to make it possible to build it in a reasonable time, we tried to keep it as simple as we could. For a career in contributions spanning six decades, three continents, and several fascinating machines, we're proud to induct Dr. Harry Husky into the Computer History Museum Hall of Fellows. The 2013 Computer History Museum Fellow Award is presented to Harry Husky tonight for his seminal work on early and important computer systems and a lifetime of service to computer education. Harry is 95 this year, and we're honored to have him with us tonight. 97, thank you. Well, I would like to say that having Parkinson's, I don't understand most of what was said tonight, but I'm sure it was very flattering as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I wrote down a few things here. The following is a record where some failed and then succeeded. I failed to pass my PhD qualifying <laughs> in mathematics at Ohio State. My advisor suggested a new topic, which I passed. Also, I published it in the Duke Mathematical Journal, and I was awarded a postdoc, and for one year received a regular appointment at the university of Pennsylvania. While there, I applied for an offer of a part-time classified military job, which had been built and were, wait a minute, I missed the line. While there, I supplied for an offer of a part-time classified military job, and clearance came in shout Six weeks, I saw the ENIAC, the first electronic computer. The Warrenden, the computer was finished, but firing tables for which had been built were of no use. Even so, interested in fast computation grew rapidly. Several projects showed on interest in large memories. Thousand words versus the 20 words of the ENIAC. Mercury delay lines or holiday or cathode ray tubes were used. Arguments with Penn, that's the university, led to others leaving and I left for England where I had a one year appointment at NPL. Working under Turing in mathematics, I proposed that the group design a small computer versus the large computer that Turing wanted. Director Darwin, Sir Charles Darwin really, moved the project to the electronics division and we went back to the United States. After time in Washington, we moved to UCLA where I would design and supervise the construction of the SWAC, Standard Western Automatic Computer. SWAC was the fastest in the world for a year and remained in service for 17 years. NBS had trouble testing battery additive that led to the establishment of a committee recommendation 
that the National Bureau of Standards dump all of its extra prop projects and confine their attention to standards. Strike went to UCLA. We went to Berkeley. Restoring, recovering my notes from England, I designed a computer, the Bendix G15. It was small enough to be given to one engineer to do computation. In summary, I turned failure into a decisive address. I learned about ENIAC and changed from mathematician to being a computer specialist. I designed and supervised the construction of fast, long-life computers with SWAC. I designed and sold the rights for Bendix to designer, to manufacture and sell about 400 G15s. I spent the rest of my academic life designing computer centers and teaching computer programming worldwide. I hope you will forgive me for sounding so boastful, but I've enjoyed every moment of it. And supplement. <laughs> In the discussion about Groucho Marx, <laughs> there was one unintended question. What state is south of Iowa? And I still don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Tonight, we honor Robert Taylor, a visionary who pushed people and institutions to their limits in pursuit of a new, interactive way of using a computer. Taylor led the development of the ARP ARPANET <laughs> in its early stages, then was director of the Xerox Park Computer Science Laboratory, where the graphical user interface, laser printing, word processing, and ethernet were invented. He was then director of the Digital Systems Research Center, we present a br brief video of him describing some of the projects he has been involved with and how he manages technical talent. Let's take a look. ARPA was formed as a result of Sputnik. We were surprised by Sputnik in October of 57. In 58, uh, Eisenhower asked Secretary of Defense to create an agency in the Defense Department that would be a quick reaction agency that would fund long-term research so that we would not get hopefully surprised again. And so people through this mechanism of the computer would learn of one another and of one another's software data or programs that they might use, uh, one another's interest as it was expressed by what they were doing with the computer. That was a sociological phenomenon, therefore. And so why not network these time sharing systems uh, nationally? And let's expand this sociological phenomenon. And in February of 66, I went in to see the head of ARPA, Charles Hertzfeld, and said, I'd like to build a network that would connect these time-sharing systems. And he understood right away what I was talking about. And uh, he took a million dollars out of one of his other programs and he put it in my program and we were off and running on the ARPANET.
I was looking for people that uh, would endorse my vision, that thought it made sense. But more important than that, I was looking for people who I knew to be really good. There were between four and 5,000 Altos built. Uh, most of them were within Xerox. The White House had some under Carter. The Senate and the House had Dover printers, or a printer at least, which was the laser printer. A bunch of people from Palo Alto were asked to put together exhibits in effect that were live exhibits that were, were running exhibits of, of the various capabilities that the Alto system could demonstrate. There was a stage filled with uh, several different stations, I guess you'd call them, uh, uh, showing Xerox things. Uh, the Alto doing word processing, do, uh, doing uh, printing, doing email, so they could actually sit down and, and have direct experience. Well, one would notice by looking over the whole room in the afternoon that all the men were kind of standing back on the, against the wall or out on the periphery, and all the women were eagerly moving from one alto to another to another, engaging, sitting down, working the keyboard, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and someone observed that uh, men grew up in a culture where it was degrading to learn how to type, to know how to type, because typing was a secretarial skill, and the women knew how to type. Well, that was, that should have been a foretelling of what was to come. The first time I visited the Webster Research Center, which is where the copier research went, went on in, in uh, Rochester, outside of Rochester, New York, uh, the head of uh, one of the labs at that center greeted me at the lobby as I arrived, and the first thing he said to me was, you know, uh, the computer will never be as important and valuable to society as the copier. People who stay together in a group uh, are motivated by having other good people around them and they're demotivated if they have to work with someone who's not quite so, who's a, who, who isn't quite up to it. So the spirit of the place, uh, if, you can, if you can get rid of people who are not so good, the spirit of the place, you can see it just sort of pick up a little bit. Uh, the other good thing is it enables you to hire new people. You, you, after a while you run into a, you come into a state, if you don't do this, where, well, you have no more headcount. So there's no way to improve your organization. And then when you do hire someone, you try to hire them with a conscious effort to make your organization better. So all of this might, just spilling it off like this, might seem pretty cold, cruel, and calculating. Uh, if it is, so be it. I think it's the way to run a good research center. The 2013 Computer History Museum Fellow Award is presented to Robert W. Taylor tonight for his leadership in the development of computer networking online information and communication systems, and modern personal computing. Robert was unable to be with us tonight, so here to accept the award on his behalf is his son, Kurt Taylor. Let's please welcome Kurt to the stage. Thank you all. Uh, hopefully, you've all made the cut. Um, you know, Bob. Bob's fairly harsh about these kinds of things. So, uh, uh, I do have a list of all the attendees. It's being vetted right now. <clears throat> Bob uh, regrets his absence this evening. 
Um, he is alive and well in Woodside. Uh, he welcomes visitors, uh, email, calls, whatever. Um, please do reach out if uh, you've been thinking that uh, you've been remiss, and uh, he would love to hear from you. Uh, I will uh, present his uh, remarks, his remarks. <laughs> thank you, Darla, and thank you, John. Thank you to the Computer History Museum. I'm grateful to the Computer History Museum for electing me as a fellow of the museum. I retired 17 years ago in 1996 and had, long ago, given up thinking about such things. But I am grateful nonetheless. I do, however, have some trouble with the way in which we as a society implement the idea of awards. Like this one, awards are usually given to individuals, but in computer research, especially in computer systems research, significant achievements are accomplished by teams of people, not just by one or two. For example, the Alto system at the Computer Science Lab of Xerox Park was designed and built from the contributions of more than two dozen researchers. Today, a list of them reads like a who's who of computer science. A half dozen of these are already CHM fellows, but like me, they are here as individuals. Yet again, like me, they owe and depend upon many colleagues for their accomplishments. While at NASA in the early 1960s, I awarded a research contract to Doug Engelbart's group at SRI. The work of that group made me look good, not my work, their work. In 1966, I initiated the ARPANET project, which came online in 1969. Many people contributed to that project, and again, their work, not mine, made me look good. Again, throughout the 70s and 80s and the first half of the 90s, outstanding work by the research researchers at Park and Dex Cirque made me look good. I am here primarily because of them. And I'm not the only one who owes so much to so many. Every one of the 65 fellows of the Computer History Museum are here in part because of the work of a lot of other contributors. And a lot of these contributors are not being recognized. Shouldn't that make us all feel a little guilty? <laughs> Remember, you made the cut. <clears throat> we say we are team players, but underneath, we still worship the individual. We accept the inevitability of team creativity, but we remain fascinated with the one-man band. Now I can understand why in some practical sense this is as it is, but it doesn't have to be. Why not establish a new awards tradition for recognizing extraordinary group accomplishments? In addition to Park's Computer Science Lab and DEX Systems Research Center, I offer a few more examples from the past. Disney's Animation Group, the Lockheed Skunk Works, the Manhattan Project. Surely the accomplishments of these groups can compete favorably with anyone's individual achievement. A Japanese proverb comes to mind. None of us are as smart as all of us. Thank you very much. Our third fellow honoree this evening is a pioneer in computer graphics, animation, and filmmaking. Over a career spanning four decades, Ed Catmull has made groundbreaking contributions to the foundations of computer graphics, as well as co-founding Pixar, maker of some of our most beloved films. Dr. Catmull is also one of the architects of the RenderMan software, software really it's our program, I can't say it. <laughs> RenderMan software program, which has become the industry standard for rendering animated films. Tonight, we honor Ed Catmull and present a short video of his work and its impact. I grew up in Salt Lake um, and spent the first uh, 19 years of my life in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake at this time was, uh, was post-war, uh, so while I was just a little kid, the, uh, the, the mood that I remember at the time was one of, of general optimism and of safety. Television was coming out. Einstein was this very public icon. Walt Disney was, was coming on the television. For me, that these were the two big icons of my childhood. I was particularly taken with Pinocchio and with Peter Pan. And Peter Pan was very uh, magical. It was, it was really pretty astonishing because I came and there was that whole world in my head. So I watched these programs, everything I could, looked at all the animation I could, and it was clear to me that I wanted to be an animator. The problem was, is when I graduated from high school, 
I didn't know where to go. There were no, no schools for animation. And my skill level was not anywhere near what it needed to be. So when I entered college, at that time I switched over and decided to go into physics instead. I got two bachelor's degrees, one in physics, the other in computer science. When I went graduate school, the first course I took was in computer graphics. Those first pictures were black and white, they were polygonal, um, they had jaggies along the edges, they were very crude. Everything was crude. But you can see the computers are going to get to be faster uh, and that here's something to pursue. And that's when I connected the dots to say, oh, I can use this for making art. Alex Shore wanted to fund computer animation, so he called me up to see if I wanted to go down and do computer animation. And I said yes. Alex wanted to be the new Walt Disney, and the reason we knew this was every day he said he didn't want to be the new Walt Disney. It's continually on his mind. But at the same time, he viewed us as the artists of the future. George had made Star Wars, the first one, and it was so significant that he wanted to bring more technology in at a time when nobody else in the whole industry was willing to do that. They flew me out to meet with George on some soundstage in LA. The thing I remember at the time was that they'd asked me, as they had asked other people, who else should they talk to? So I gave them the names of all the other people that I thought would be appropriate for the job. And in giving that name, I gave the name of every person they were, in fact, had found and they were talking to. But when they talked to the others because they wanted the job, they wouldn't give any other names out. So they hired me because I was the only person willing to give out the names of the other people. The computers at that time were nowhere near what we needed. So we hired Rodney Stock to come in and design a special purpose computer. So the thing that we designed ended up becoming the Pixar image computer, which was then the product when Pixar became a company. George and his wife got a divorce, and the result was they had to split up the assets. And George wanted to keep in the control, 100% control of the company, which meant that the, the cash basically went to his wife. At that time, it was decided that we would spin this off as a separate company. We were introduced to Steve Jobs. Steve came up, uh, he met with us, it, was, it all went very well, and, and Steve negotiated a, a deal with Lucasfilm, which bought them out entirely. And then we started in, in 1986. I recognized that at Disney, that they put together this phenomenal group they had the nine old men that was led by Walt Disney, and they produced a succession of great films. Now in our case, there's John, Steve, and I founding the company. Steve is now gone. But we have to ask, what happens? Uh, so we tried to be thoughtful about that. How do we generate the talent, and how do we make it so that we're gone, they can do it? Because they can't repeat what we did. Because we lived through a thing, and we had a certain set of experiences, and our environment, the conditions that we went through don't exist anymore. The fact is, change is happening. And the more we understand that and embrace it part of our life, I think the, the, the better off we'll be and we'll be in a better position to solve a lot of the formidable problems that are in front of us. The 2013 Computer History Museum Fellow Award is presented to Ed Catmull tonight for his pioneer work in computer graphics, animation, and filmmaking. So please join me in welcoming Ed Catmull to the stage to accept the award. <laughs> History Museum, quite an honor. Um, we were uh, here before the, uh, the, the uh, dinner doing a little preparation. 
I'd been thinking about things to say about the community and that, that made all these things take place. And uh, so I heard Kurt read the speech that his father gave about how it was other people that actually did it. And then John got up and said, well, that's actually what happens. Um, so it sort of took a lot of this out, but the, the fact is it is kind of awkward to get up there and, and take it when you know everybody else that was involved in making this happen. And the truth is that it's probably impossible to tell the real story that happens. And the way it works is it usually focuses on one or two people that, that are highlighted. So you hear stories about George Lucas or Steve Jobs or John Lasseter. Um, and, and you can't tell all the complexity. Uh, just like with a museum here, it's a place of telling stories, but you can only pick out little anecdotes and tell little stories and try to give some glimpse of what happens in the hopes that somebody will then try to have their own stories. Uh, <clears throat> we were given a walkthrough by John of the museum, a quick walkthrough, we didn't have a lot of time. But what was impressive about it was the sense as we were going quickly through it of the wave after wave. And I remember going through some of those waves and there was this thing where they would come out with something like well, a computer to begin with and a lot of people would look at this primitive idea and say, well, it's, there's a limit to where it is. And we, we just heard the story of the, the, the printer being more important than the computer. But when graphics came out, uh, the architects were saying, well, you know, this really isn't a practical tool. And for in the medical world, because we went through this, the, the uh, medical imagery, imagery would never be acceptable to people who are used to looking at film with x-rays. Um, wave after wave. Um, and what really happens, of course, is that when the ideas start, they are fragile and they're new and most people don't understand them. And the things that are fragile need to be protected. And part of being, of being in any good way is to recognize that we have to protect things. We don't know where they're going. And some of those things will fail. And that really is okay, not in just a, uh, a sense that it's a necessary evil, but in fact, it's a necessary act that we go out and try something. Um, in our case, as we went through the waves, there were these early days back of uh, the University of Utah and uh, New York Tech and then Lucasfilm. And we were in this group together trying to solve these problems. And I've got my partner for many years, uh, Albert Ray Smith here, uh, Tom Porter is here. And these were people working hard to solve problems where we actually didn't know exactly where I was going at the time, just that we wanted to go off in a, a particular direction. But then the waves continued. We may have had success, but the one thing I didn't want to have, have happen was that you get this big success and it all falls apart. Because um, you can't repeat what you did before. You really can't repeat it. So what you have to do is think of, okay, what's the next wave? What is this thing that we're trying to protect? So for us, it was not just to make a film. How do we go on and do it in a different way? And so Darla, who's at MC, was participating in figuring out how to do this. Because when we started, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. We were just making this stuff up, and some of it worked, and some of it didn't. Some of the stuff that we worked up today is actually still crap, but because it worked, we're still hanging on to it. <laughs> and we're hoping somebody figures out <laughs> which of the stuff it is that we are doing that's crap. Um, and now we're, we're still on the trenches. Um, so today I've got my partners here and we're trying to solve this new set of problems and issues as the technology changes as it should. We've got uh, Jim Morris, uh, he's been many years with ILM, but now he's running Pixar. And uh, it's a, a challenge And how do we actually uh, keep things going but at the same time push the change in and not be overcome by the conservative forces that happen to overcome so many places. And then at Disney, uh, here Disney had had this original wave which inspired me, and then it fell apart. And then there was another wave that came in uh, during these musicals in the 90s, and then it fell apart. So it says, okay, why is it falling apart? What is different? How do we bring this back? So now we've got, you know, my partners here, Anne LeCam and Andrew Milstein, 
are part of a group saying, how do we make this group work together, reinforce each other, and basically invent it, but not be a copy of Pixar, to have its own way. This participation in the trenches is different than the story. And we have to tell the story. The story will always be full of errors, but the richness and the complexity is actually being in the trenches. And uh, that, for me, is when I've been the, has been the most enjoyable thing in my life. So thank you very much for this award. So if I were Steve Jobs, I would be saying just one more thing. <laughs> Those of you who have been to the Fellows Awards know that uh, there's a terrific after party that begins immediately in the lobby, and I want to get you there as quickly as possible. Uh, but first I want to say one final thing. Several months ago, the museum received a transformational gift. There's a gift in the life of every collecting museum that can be the thing that really sets you apart, and I think we've received it. It's the entire collection of patent and laboratory notebooks from Fairchild Semiconductor Corporation. Fairchild formed in 1958 by the so-called Traitorous Eight, the brilliant renegade scientists led by Bob Noyce, Gordon Moore, Jean Hernie, and the others you see pictured here. Just months after forming Fairchild, Noyce, Moore, and the rest had perfected the design of the integrated circuit, the chip that founded Silicon Valley and changed the world forever. On page 70 of Bob Noyce's notebook, you will read in his own handwriting his initial thoughts on the design of the integrated circuit, a breakthrough for which, had he lived, he undoubtedly would have shared the Nobel Prize with Jack Kilby in 1980. Now, some museums would take a precious collection like this, and they would hide it away in offices or cubbies reachable only by curators and scholars. And of course, our amazingly talented curators and the visiting scholars who will come to study these notebooks treasure them, and they will be working in them for years. But do you remember that final scene, speaking of filmmaking and Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> where that wooden crate is pushed down that long hallway and it disappears into oblivion? Well, we happily are not that kind of museum. That's why just 72 hours ago, we placed three of the rarest notebooks, those of Andy Grove, Gordon Moore, and Bob Noyce, with Noyce's notebook open to that fateful page 70 on display in our first floor gallery. You can't miss them because they're under a banner that looks just like the one that you saw. And so as you're enjoying the after party tonight, I really urge you to go by and look at those notebooks, which, as Lynn said in his opening remarks, really are the Dead Sea Scrolls of Silicon Valley. Savor them, connect to the great fellows, have fun with each other, enjoy the dessert cordials and cigars outside, and we'll see you downstairs. Thanks, everyone.